Harper guys have to speak. A little bit daunting. Uh, thank you for coming and talking because I, I knew instantly that I would know less about the subject than every other person in the room, except maybe Vince. <laughs> Um, but uh, as, uh, as Raj said, um, I did have the privilege of being at, at ARPA, DARPA now, it was ARPA at the time. Um, and so I thought I would take a little, uh, talk a little bit about that. And then Raj also said uh, we should say something about um, our own career trajectory, whatever. So um, uh, a couple of things that uh, stick out very much in my mind. I was a, a math geek as a kid. And by math geek, I mean that if I had to go to a party, I would take a math book with me so that I could read it on the side. Definitely. <laughs> and I uh, started hanging around computer centers in high school, around 11th grade. In Los Angeles, in um, my senior year of high school, I was also able to take a course at UCLA. Um, governed mostly by what courses were available in the afternoon on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday when we would all four of us get in a car and drive over. Psych 1A was uh, accessible. So, well, that sounds interesting. So I take this introductory psychology course, very prosaic, one topic after another. And, the, and we were counseled as uh, high school students in this environment that we should not be bashful, no problem. <laughs> And at one point, the Guthrie model of uh, perception was introduced with four axioms. Axioms? I know what axioms are. <laughs> if you look it up today, I, you can hardly find any reference to it, and it's not very prominent, but it was. So I, I said, could you, could you program something like that and see it work? I don't remember getting a, an immediate uh, uh, answer, but to my surprise, several weeks later, the professor calls me in and he says he's written a couple of letters on my behalf. One went to System Development Corporation where they were teaching third graders to program. No big deal today, but back in 1960, 61, uh, big deal. And the other went to a RAND Corporation and this guy wrote back a letter, a few pages with all kinds of details about where this was happening and where you could study and what you should do. And so they invited me to come down and chat, so I did. And uh, chatted with him for comfortably for a while. And he handed me a paper by a guy named Feigenbaum and then uh, some other papers. It was about six months before I had a clue what an audience with Herb Simon was all about. <laughs> <laughs> Suffice it to say, I was bit. Uh, and AI was in my mind, in my blood, um, from, from that point on. UCLA did not have a lot of opportunities to study that sort of thing, and I was not too good a student, actually. I spent an awful lot of time on computers and less time in classes, so it took me a little longer to get through the process. But eventually I went off to uh, MIT, uh, to Minsky's AI lab, uh, and after about a year and a half there, I was um, needing a good, high-paying summer job. Vint was now a uh, grad student at UCLA working for the same professor that I had worked for as an undergraduate, Jerry Estrin. And um, they, uh, they made me a very nice offer to come back and work for the summer, 1968. So I came back. Um, first thing that happened was there was a graduate student conference that uh, Vint was going to go on behalf of UCLA and I thought, well, that looks pretty nifty, but I was an MIT person. Eventually, Minsky uh, woke up and uh, realized he had to send a couple of people to the same thing. Pat Winston and I came from MIT, uh, from the AI lab. There were two others from Project Mac. And I walk into the room. There's 30 people, all white males in those days. <coughs> and the, the um, projects that were all the ones that I had independently thought were pretty cool stuff, even if I wasn't working in graphics and architecture and programming languages and a, lot, and a lot of AI. And I was just simply blown away. So I went up to the guy who was running it, Barry Wessler, who was the sole program manager in the office, as it turned out. I said, when are you leaving? He looked at me, <laughs> he looked at me like, yeah, sure, kid. Um, good news, I guess, at least for me, was eventually I actually got that job and then got to run those uh, graduate student uh, meetings for a few years. Um, that was the beginning of the summer, as it turned out. 
And then in the middle of the summer, oh, and one of the things that Barry talked about was this network idea. Nobody was interested. Why would we be interested in that? It seemed very pedestrian. Middle of the summer, there was a, a, a meeting of, the f of representatives from the first four sites of the ARPANET. Turned out UCLA was one of those four, number one actually. So Vint and I got sent up to this meeting in Santa Barbara and we met our counterparts. Um, and it was like a cocktail party where you quickly sort out, you know, who's on the same wavelength or not. Um, and a short version is I got plunged deeply into networking stuff. End of the summer, time to go back to MIT, couldn't sleep, realized I didn't want to go back to MIT. Uh, <laughs> Struggled with it briefly. Estrin said, happy to come have you come back here. And um, so I did. So, and I made this long detour into networking. Um, and, but refused to decide that that was my research area. I still wanted to do AI kind of things. And in particular, for me, AI that time was I wanted to capture what programming was all about, what, it, what the, could you formalize and document um, sort of the program verification problem? Could you, could you relate what you had in mind to what the code looked like? Um, and, and, um, but nonetheless, I got deeply involved in that. And then I got invited to come work at ARPA. Wow, this is great, front row seat. And um, they, of course, hired me because I had been uh, active and helpful in the networking business. I wanted to go there because it would give me a front row seat on the AI uh, arena. Um, well, they were shorthanded everywhere, so it didn't matter, do something useful. So I got the AI portfolio. This program, the Speech Understanding Research Program, had been organized and, and ready to go. Five system building contracts, CMU, BBN, uh, Lincoln Laboratory, System Development Corporation, and SRI, and four specialist uh, people who actually knew something about speech, which were kind of handy to have as part of the program. <laughs> and and um, Barry Wessler was leaving, and Cordell Green had been doing a short uh, tour there, and he, he had worked with Newell and the whole committee with Raj and others developing the uh, program plan. And, and then it was handed to me. And, and it was like, I felt like a kid in a candy store. I mean, this was just perfect. And working, I must say, I enjoyed, I enjoyed all of it, but I enjoyed coming to CMU more than anything else. It was always my, my favorite tour. Um, so I put together, so I said, what, what would be useful to say? So one of the, the thoughts I had is uh, there are some things about the bureaucracy and the sequence of events that may be less well known uh, in general. So I thought back about it. If we go back to the mid 50s and somebody's got to operate this. Do I just push a button here? <laughs> yep, that looks. No, you just started World War III. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's so, so, so this is a Three Rivers talk, but, but the Three Rivers is just accidentally the same as Pittsburgh Three Rivers. And in fact, the three rivers aren't the same. Pittsburgh has two rivers that merge into one. Um, this is really a different sort of, of three rivers. Um, if you go back into the... In, it's, it, it's your fault. That the, well, never mind, we'll have a side conversation about this diagram. Um, so you go back into the mid-50s and uh, sort of ask what was going on. Well, one thing that was obviously going on was a Cold War between the US and Russia, big time. And um, another was that computers were beginning to come alive and be commercialized. And IBM quickly rose to the, to the top and, and uh, dominated the industry for many, many years. Uh, and computers were all of a sudden everywhere. And the, um, the third thing, that was less visible to almost everybody, but most important, particularly to us here and eventually to the world, was that there was a, uh, a smallish group of people who thought about computers as tools that could help us. 
So it included interactive, uh, uh, interactive uh, uh, computing, included uh, interpretive as opposed to batch processing or, or compiled uh, programs. It included, um, of course, AI and all of the things related to that of how do you get computers to uh, uh, participate at various levels of smartness, if you will. <coughs> A lot of that activity around Boston, but of course here and in few pockets around the country as well. So those three things all percolated. There was a, uh, a pivotal meeting, um, the Dartmouth um, AI, the Dartmouth Workshop, I think it was called, in the mid-50s that McCarthy organized and that had a lot of names that you would recognize. Um, well, the space race was a critical part of the, um, oops, space race was a critical part of the, of, of the uh, competition with, with Russia, with, with the Soviet Union. And the U.S. Army and the U.S. Navy were vigorously competing with each other to be, to get, to be in space first. And we know who won, the Russians won. Um, and that was a big shock. How did that happen? And what can we do to prevent that in the future? And ARPA, Advanced Research Projects Agency was quickly created. So uh, Sputnik went up in late 57. ARPA was created in the you know, first few days of, of 1958. And it was given a mission of prevent technological surprise. First thing it had to do was organize a space program. NASA was spun out. The military side of the space program was spun out. And ARPA persisted. <coughs> a certain amount of contention as to whether not all of the military was happy to have an agency that was outside of the Army, Navy, or Air Force. It was plugged in right at the top of the Defense Department. It was part of the Office of Secretary of Defense. Office of Secretary of Defense sounds like an office of a Secretary of Defense and a you know, executive assistant. No, it's about 2,000 people. Um, <laughs> so it had bunches of things. And the 2,000 people is actually important later how did DARPA become DARPA as opposed to ARPA? Because there was a headhunting crew that went around saying, it was bloated office, we've got to reduce the headcount. I said, okay, so they took the 150 people that was ARPA, carved it out, made it a defense agency, put a D in front of it, and now the Office of Secretary of Defense was smaller. Um, I was, I, was, I was working at ARPA at the time this happened in 1972 and the director had us all in a room and explained it all. He said it's like a 5% difference and I can now sign my own travel orders and I hate putting this D in front of ARPA. It sounded wrong and that was sort of the end of it uh, for a while. So that was the creation of ARPA and, uh, and the, 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 the stuff that most of us are aware of is that uh, the style of, of funding is pick a project, put a lot of money into it, make a big difference, factor of 10, not 10% was the slogan, and five years is kind of a nominal amount of time. Well, uh, here we are 50 years in. Um, so the left side is the stuff that, that we know about. It's the right side that is of, uh, also of interest. Um, one of the things that ARPA could do was pick and choose what it wanted to do which was different from the way a lot of other funding agencies operated where they had to have justifications and studies and all kinds of approval and determination and findings. Another, sounds, this is gonna sound really mundane and, and, and incidental, is they didn't have any contracting officers and you can't spend money uh, in the government unless you have a contracting officer involved. Instead of having their own contracting officers, they had the authority to use any contracting shop anywhere in the government. Why does that matter? Well, these contracting shops are slow and there's long queues of stuff to be done. And if you can pick and choose your contracting shop and in addition get priority to be at the front of the queue, you can operate at lightning speed compared to your counterparts in other agencies. It's absolutely amazing. And as a additional beneficial side effect, the director of the agency his attention span is not is not distracted by having a whole uh, army of contracting officers and all of their support people as part of his staff so he gets to focus more on on content instead of process um, a different and 
and uh, critically important aspect of, of ARPA in, the, in those days was that this business of pick a project, factor 10, spend a lot of money, five-year project, was th what dominated the, uh, 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 the process, what, what, what they spent their time. But there was also room for a completely different approach in certain basic technologies that were viewed as uh, fundamental and would have a long, long uh, time to develop. It was okay to spend a relatively small amount of money on these more basic technologies. Computer science turned out to be one of them. Surprisingly, it's not the first. Material science preceded it slightly, and there were a series of uh, interdisciplinary laboratories set up around the country focused on material science research, and in a completely different audience that I've never been part of will be retrospectives of the great stuff that was done. Uh, ceramic turbines was one, th one thing. Um, so here's a, uh, a quick look from a funding point of view. Uh, the, uh, I put this graph in there for reference, but the, the main takeaway is that ARPA was a very, very small portion of the overall research, development, test, and evaluation budget of the Defense Department. So that when you look at from the top down, from DOD downward at uh, where the money's going, McNamara's uh, famous 10-point uh, uh, organization of the defense budget line, 6 was RDT&E, 6.1 was basic research, 6.2, and so forth. And the amount of money devoted to each of those four categories were, each one was a big step up. So basic research was small, development was bigger, test bigger, evaluation much bigger. And uh, why are those so big? Because in those big tests and evaluation programs is the development of the next fighter is being evaluated. And so you gotta have a few fighters around to do that. By comparison, the stuff we do is penny ante, rounding error kind of stuff. Um, this deserves about three seconds. This is what was happening in computing, uh, the computing uh, technology. Moore's law dominated everything, factor of 10 every five years, and we all know uh, the impact that that's had. And then, as I said, this little trickle that eventually burgeoned and became everything uh, was the development of, of what I'll just call the vision of uh, computers being very intimately involved with human interaction. Everything from uh, just being easy to use to <coughs> carrying some of the burden and, and, um, and, and even helping us understand what, uh, what the human mind is all about. ARPA was started in late 58. Um, it was divided up into a, a handful of, of offices. Each office had a staff, a director, and, and program managers. Um, relatively soon, but not quite at the outset, uh, DOD recognized had a big problem with command and control. SAGE system was not working very well. Kennedy came in uh, in 61, uh, and there was a, a big shuffling of uh, senior people. And, um, two things came together. One was Fubini, who was um, essentially number two in the de Defense Director of Research and Engineering shop, which was the, the top level shop plugged into the Secretary of Defense um, that oversaw all of the R&D across the DOD. And Fubini was a, a madman, super smart, and putting pieces together all over the place. And then Licklider, um, who was part of the Boston community, if you will, and was also everywhere. <coughs> and the short story is um, uh, Fubini wanted ARPA to have a command and control program. Question is, what was it going to consist of and who was going to run it? And he was familiar with Licklider. Licklider pitched Fubini. Um, Frick, for also from Lincoln, also pitched Licklider. It was the compelling one, and um, Lick was either invited or insisted on or got dragged into, depending on which version of the story <laughs> you listen to. But anyway, he came and set up the office. And uh, part of that deal was to go and create long-term programs here, MIT, 
Harvard, Berkeley, uh, Stanford, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> and that leads to the history that we've all uh, known and, and grown up in. So I thought that that was um, maybe a little useful piece of stuff to thing. So here's uh, all the heroes. Um, a question that I don't know the answer to. I knew Perlis a little bit, but not a lot. Why did he ever leave here? He got an offer from Yale and wanted to be in Connecticut for personal reasons. Did he really want to be in Connecticut? I, I believe so. Interesting. So, <laughs> thank you. I understood that. I don't have that time. We, That's what he can ask his kid who have his contact information. Yeah, he, he was at Yale. I was here at CMU. A student at that time. That's what he told us. Well, actually, I was a. a a junior faculty member in a constructor, but that's what he told us, is that it was <coughs> personal. He wanted to teach uh, non-science majors. I see. Mm -hmm. and he wanted to see what he could do with non-science majors. That's what he told us. Yeah, the, the, uh, I, I know the inside story. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there, there were three big pillars, right? Newell, Simon, and Perth. And they created the whole department here, mm -hmm. and they were here from the 50s all through 60s. And Yale desperately wanted to start some in computer science. So first they got him as the chairman of the advisory group to come and advise them how to set up a computer center. Then they made him an offer he couldn't refuse. <laughs> and that's what happened. And we said, don't go, Alan, this is silly, you know. Because, you know, he was revered here at CMU, but when he went there, he was another, you know, prima donna, whatever, <laughs> and they, they didn't pay much attention to him. So when he passed away, I think it was 87 or whenever, I went there, Nico Haberman went there because we were close, close to him. So there was nobody there to be, speak at the memorial service. I spoke and Nico spoke, but maybe there were one or two but somehow, he was not as appreciated there. It's too sad, but, but he went there. And, uh, oops. But anyway, that is inside story. But, but, uh, <laughs> he was the one who told me to come here for grad school, you know, and change the course of my life. And he, a few years later, I went to a reunion, and everybody just revered Alan. So this things came full circle. <laughs> He told me to apply here too. <laughs> I wasn't going to business in Pittsburgh. In yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we always we have run out of time. Well, I'm, 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 yeah, yeah, well, I got one more thing I want to squeeze in here. Thank you. I'm sorry, uh, rambling on. So, uh, uh, just quickly on, on budget numbers. Um, so I said how small ARPA was compared to the rest of the Defense Department budget within ARPA. <laughs> IPTO, the Information Processing Techniques Office, was a small portion of ARPA, and the AI program within that was a yet smaller portion. So AI was like 1% of ARPA. That made it possible, not necessary, but possible, for AI to proceed without a whole lot of oversight and a whole lot of demand. Meanwhile, the Vietnam War is raging, and you know Congress is always difficult to deal with, and so forth. But with a certain amount of support and insight from key people, it could proceed. We know that that didn't persist continuously, and there was AI winter. I was gone by that time, fortunately. Um, but that was the the kind of the funding story. Um, the AI program. What kind of program was it? It was. You guys, you guys are smart guys. Go make things happen. So Minsky had a laboratory. McCarthy had a laboratory. Um, uh, you know, here and at SRI and so forth. And if you go and look and say, so, so what is the, what is the, the stick? What are, you, what are you, you doing? It was every sort of thing. So a grad student wanted to do something, or a professor wanted to do something, they would do it. So I kind of think of it as kind of a primordial ooze with <laughs> things just, just, uh, and then, and then. And I learned this little detail because Raj helped fill in. Uh, Art Samuels, the checkers guy who had uh, uh, retired from, uh, from uh, IBM and went off to Stanford, and Licklider, the two of them, suggested that, hey, there's a bunch of speech stuff happening. Why don't we have an organized program? And suggested to ARPA, to Larry Roberts, uh, and then, who then enlisted Newell to chair a study. Raj was part of that. 
Cordell Green was in the office and, and provided some support. And out of that came the speech understanding research program that brought us here. And then as I said at the beginning, and I showed up in July 71, I get the AI portfolio, this thing is beautifully organized. I think this is fantastic. And we have a meeting uh, of the principal investigators and specialists and a few government people. And Raj says, it's a five year program, thousand word vocabulary. Raj says, I can have something working in six months. <laughs> Well, I'd only been a program manager for a few months, but I know first things about how to be a program manager. You're on. <laughs> Six months to the day. So we set the date, and we came, and it was memorable. It was one of the best presentations and explanations then, and I saw quite a few, as, as you do in, in that kind of job. My recollection, though, is a little different from what you said. Um, Pawn to Queen 4. Uh, recorded the night before, and we know how these things go. They set the date for a review, and you go there, and you know that people have been working furiously, you know, days, weeks, and particularly the night before. <laughs> and a beautiful room, a tiered sort of uh, uh, auditorium, and a screen a, a set up uh, every two seats. So this is back in 1972. That was uh, no small matter. <coughs> And we get, we get shown the input, and then we get shown each stage of the processing. And this is artificial intelligence and syntax and you know, context, as well as serious signal processing going on at the bottom and you know, speech, under, speech uh, knowledge about what uh, you know, transform into formants and then look to see what, what the vowels are and look to see where the stop consonants are and then work hard at the stuff in between. And it makes the wrong move. <laughs> But it wasn't like, oh yeah, it's a big failure. This was one-tenth of the way through the program, and the fact that it had anything working at all was fantastic. And then we said, so let's see the dictionary. And uh, so they show us the dictionary, and it shows up on the screen. <coughs> Stop consonants and uh, 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 long vowels are easy. Um, as I said, liquids and glides are really terrible, and there's stuff in between the fricatives and so forth. Spelling in the dictionary for king, a K sound, an E sound, and this funny nasal stuff at the end. And the nasals are complicated because you've got dual passages and that screws up the math of trying to sort that out. Spelling for queen, a K sound, a w, w, I forget the w, an E sound, and this nasal, same spelling for king and queen. No way in the world for the system to understand <laughs> the difference between king and queen as spoken. You can only do it from context, and on the opening move, there isn't enough difference between pawn to king four and pawn to queen four. <coughs> Giggle. But <laughs> deep understanding that you know, this really is just one toe forward in the program and a huge amount of stuff been put together. So nonetheless, it was compelling. So anyway, that stuck in my mind. And as, uh, as Raj said, several months ago, I realized that the 50th year of that demo was coming up and I sent Raj a note and here we are. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> there, there is stuff here, but this is mainly for reference.